Scriptures. 2 Peter, if you'd go there with me, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading in verse 12 in just a minute. Peter here, as he writes this second epistle, he's doing exactly what God charged him to do, and that was to strengthen the brethren. He's desiring to strengthen you and I, yet the brethren. If you know Christ is your Savior tonight, you know you've passed from death into life, you know if you died this moment you'd be in heaven with Him, then God has written this for you and for me. And uh, we've gone through what His desire is, was to strengthen them. He wanted to give them stability and pointing them to the Word of God that was sure and they could trust it and they could anchor their life by the, this book. Uh, he desired that they would grow that's the key verse of the book, the last verse of the book, but grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. His desire was for them to grow and that they would progress in this Christian walk. And, and that's what God desires for you and me, no doubt about that. He wants you to know Him more today than you did yesterday. Know Him more this year. Be closer to Him this year than you were last year. And if that's not the case for you, if you're in church less, if you're, uh, you're in, uh, walking with God in your Bible and prayer less than you were, then you're on the wrong track. You're headed for a fall like Peter had as a backslidden Christian. And so he's trying to strengthen the brethren. He said in chapter 1, you don't have to fall. Uh, chapter 1 and verse number, uh, verse number 10. Uh, and so he, that's what's his desire to encourage believers. And I, I appreciate what God's given us in this book of Second Peter as the Lord, the Holy Spirit of God, used this human penman and he gave the very words. Second Peter chapter 2, look at verse 12. We'll begin there. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now we're starting here a little bit back of where we're going to preach tonight, but just to give the context, we're talking about these false teachers. He said in verse 1, there were false prophets and there shall be false teachers and they are here. And we know that in our world today, the people that speak error, and the Bible calls it in verse 1, damnable heresies. And so this is what he's speaking of. He's describing, he's exposing uh, error. And if you love truth, you want error exposed. You want danger. You want poison written on error of false doctrine like this that are damnable. Meaning if you embrace these things, it'll be an eternity in hell for those that embrace the things because they will not trust Christ as Savior. It's a false doctrine. Verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way, there's the problem, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. Verse 17 is where we'll begin our study tonight. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in air. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed who are wallowing in the mire. I'm bringing a message tonight entitled, Entangled with Freedom. Entangled with Freedom. Getting that from verse 19a, while they promised them liberty, 
they themselves a servant of corruption. Let's pray. Lord, help us now. We would get exactly what you'd have for each of us, all of us, different backgrounds, different walks of life perhaps, some members here, some visiting tonight. Praise you for all that are here, but each of us have a need. We all need to hear from you. All of us need to grow. And Lord, may you work in our lives. Ones here that aren't saved, Lord, if there be some here that way, that they would trust you tonight. They would take Peter's admonition, making their calling and election sure, if they're unsure. Lord, those that don't know you as Savior, that we would be genuine, we would be real, we would, Lord, learn what it is to love the truth. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Entangle with freedom, you might say off the bat, your title doesn't make sense. <laughs> Entangle with freedom. I remember my brother and I, and boys are just dumb, you know. Amen, right, girls? Boys are just dumb, right? And, uh, and we, my dad would leave us sometimes at home, and we'd be, you know, when we got to be old enough where we were able to be on our own, and, and sometimes we'd be by ourselves, or the girls would be doing their thing, and we'd be, but mom and dad were gone. And, and we, used, we got in this thing where we were, I don't know if we saw some show or movie, you know, Houdini type thing, I don't know. But what we would do, and we wouldn't do this when mom and dad were there because they would tell us not to, but we would, uh, we would get a rope or twine, I don't remember what we used, and we'd tie each other up and we'd try to see what we could get out of. And so here we are, we've got, all, we've got freedom. Mom and dad aren't here. Uh, we can do what we want to, right? And we're tying each other up and... Of course, if we ever got it, someone, one of us, we ever tied it so good the other person couldn't get out, uh, you know, then we would abuse that privilege of them being tied up, you know. And, uh, and so, anyway, I don't know how we got into this, but we got where we'd tie each other up and we couldn't get out. And, uh, you know, tying our hands and feet, different things, and then we'd, we'd mess with the person if we got them. And so my brother and I got it. We were entangled <laughs> with freedom. <laughs> We had freedom to do as we pleased. Mom and dad were at home, and here we are being tied up in that freedom. That's a kind of a picture, if you will, of what many uh, so-called free people in our world have done with their own choices in life because of the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, they think, I'm free to choose. My parents can't tell me to do it, what I'm going to do anymore. Uh, society's not going to tell me what I have to do. Uh, I'm not going to be bound by some religion or some rules, and they get this idea that they're free. I'm free to do as I please, and they find before long in bondage, tangled up. We all could give examples of people we know in that situation. And the truth is, in our churches, in the day and age we live, people want the benefits without the responsibility. Uh, they want the blessing of God without obedience to Him. I spoke with someone not long ago that told me they had forsaken God and, and doing their own thing for the last number of years, but as we spoke, they're blaming God for the situation they're in. And I tried to explain to them that how can you blame God who you said you forsook so many years ago for the situation you're now in? You said you're, you, you left Him. You, you, it was over. And so uh, that type of mindset, though, is permeates. We want God's blessing, but we don't want to obey what He's told us to do. He's given us His Word. I want freedom. After all, we're living under the age of grace. I want to be free from all these rules. I want to express my religion my way. And that's what we find in many churches. That's called the way of Cain, is what Jude called it. The way of Cain. I'll worship God my way. I'll come to God my way. And God says you have to come His way. Because Jesus is the only way. The only truth in life. It's a scary thing to realize the fact that many people who once were members of gospel preaching churches are now zealous members of all kinds of cults, and you'll meet them. You'll meet Mormons that were once Baptists. You'll meet Jehovah Witnesses that were that way. Uh, all different ones like that. Some of them are now rejecting organized religion at all and saying, I don't believe in any of it. But both would say the same thing. I feel free. I'm free from all the rules of what I used to have. Freedom's a concept that many people think it's very important to them, but don't really understand it. So what do you mean by that? Many say, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. But doing whatever you please is not freedom. The truth is we live in a free land, but you can't go out here and do whatever you please. 
I can't go across the fence and start hitting on my neighbor or something like that, whether I'm pleased to or not. They, I wouldn't be free to do that. They would come and arrest me, and rightfully so. And you're not free to do whatever you please. So freedom doesn't mean you do whatever you please, but some people have that mindset in their life. I'm doing whatever I want to do, and I'm going to do it, and, and it's going to be great. But they find out very soon that it's the worst kind of bondage because it's bondage to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is what the Lord said in 1 John. Thomas Huxley said, A man's worst difficulties begin when he's able to do just as he likes. <laughs> A lot of truth to that. The truth is the only real freedom in the world comes from receiving the right master. And that master is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's what frees us. We find when our eyes are opened by the gospel that we were in bondage all these years and we didn't even realize it. We're in bondage to this world and the world system and the devil's way and we're in bondage to sin and the appetites of the flesh and now we've been freed in Christ. And in that freedom, we have the privilege to follow Jesus. But we also have the privilege, as Adam and Eve had the choice to make, we can choose to go the wrong way too. But we have freedom in Christ. There can be no tr true freedom or fulfillment apart from submission to Jesus Christ. We're free in Christ. Free not to please the flesh and the appetites of the flesh, but free to obey the Holy Spirit and by His power we can be led into all truth. Jesus would say in John 8, 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, being the Pharisees, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye should be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So they thought they were free, but he said, you're, you're bound. You're, they were bound in religion. They were bound in sin, their own pride, self-righteousness. And the apostates that we're dealing with here in 2 Peter offer a false freedom to their converts. As it says in verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. So they promise some false freedom. That's their bait. You don't, have to, you don't have to obey all that stuff in the Bible. You just do your best you can. God loves you and He wants you to prosper. And, and they, you don't have to all these things. And so there's freedom coming out. You don't have to do all those things in our church. You can, you can be a part and do, you can have all the benefit and none of the obedience, none of the responsibility of being a child of God, a child of the King of Kings. See? And they bait them to abandon true faith and follow the false teacher. The teacher promised him liberty, but this promise never fulfilled. Remember, verse 14 says they beguile unstable souls. Converts, these unstable converts, if you will, only find themselves in terrible bondage again. The freedom offered is a false freedom. Peter gives three reasons. I want to give them to you tonight why it's false. Number one, it's based on false promises. Look at verses 17 and 18. These, these false teachers, are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in air. And so, here we have, number one, it's based on false promises. See, faith is only as good as the object of your faith. Uh, you can have little faith in thick ice, and it's safe. You can have great faith in thin ice, but you're going to possibly lose your life. And so the object of the faith is the key. The Lord Jesus needs to be that object. Well, this is the way I feel. Or is it, this is what God says. See, the object of the faith, not my feelings, that's not what I'm based my life on, but on what the Lord Jesus Christ has said in his word. And so when you put your faith in Christ, that faith will accomplish something because God, he can't lie. He always keeps his promises. Praise God for that. And he gives us three illustrations, and they're kind of word pictures here, of what, as he emphasizes this emptiness of the apost apostate's promises. An apostate's someone that's, like Judas, kissed the door of heaven, but went to hell. They knew the truth, as the Bible says right here. Uh, they they uh, knew 
but they did not receive. They forsook the right way, verse 15. They've forsaken the right way. They, there it was. They knew it, but they didn't go that way. Verse 21 says it again. They have known the way of righteousness, but they turned from it. And so Judas would be a great example of that. The Bible used Balaam as well here in this passage. Number one, these three illustrations under this is, first of all, he uses wells without water. Wells without water. You imagine being thirsty. I mean, here you are seeking Read in the Old Testament about Abraham, how they left in their paths, and Isaac, they left wells, wells of water. Imagine being thirsty here, spiritually seeking, needing help, knowing you need the Lord, and you're seeking for something that's real and true, and there's a well. There's a church that says we have the truth, and you go in there and you find out you, there's no water. There's nothing satisfying. Be like someone saying, well, we can fix your car. That car's messed up. I know how to fix it. This is the right way to fix it, and then you get back on the road in just a minute and it breaks down again. Or like someone said, well, we can fix your roof. This is what your roof needs to be done to your roof so it won't leak again. And then a little while later, it's leaking again. They didn't do it the right way. You say, well, that's, that's, that's too bad. Yeah, it is. You can get someone else, but how much worse was someone that says this is the right way to heaven? This is the right way to know God. And it's empty. There's nothing there. And only too late. Do they realize it? Wells without water. See, there's in mankind a thirst for God, to know Him. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for Thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in Thee. Thou hast made us for Thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in Thee. See, people attempt to satisfy this thirst in many ways, looking for something to fill that hole. As someone said, it's a Jesus-sized hole in all of us, and only the Lord can fill that longing of our soul. Only Jesus Christ can give inner peace and satisfaction that every person is looking for on the face of the earth. I love a song called Satisfied. It goes like this, All my life long I had panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Second stanza says, feeding on the husk around me. That first stanza makes me think of that thirsty woman at John 4, the well of water thirsty. And Jesus said, if you'll drink of me, there'll be wells of water springing up in you. All my life long, I was looking for that. Second stanza reminds me of the prodigal son, feeding on the husks around me. Till my strength was almost gone, long my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. And the chorus says, hallelujah, I have found him. Whom my soul so long has craved, Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood, I now am saved. So you can drink over and over and over and over from the broken cisterns of the world, but God says you drink, you drink of Jesus. You can drink, drink over and over of that and never find satisfaction. You, but you drink of Jesus and you can be satisfied forever. He's the one that satisfies. So the false teacher has nothing to offer. They could promise here they are, wells without water, but they could not produce. Could not produce. Number two, he says, clouds that carried of a, with a tempest, verse 17. These are clouds that are carried with a tempest. What's he saying? Well, clouds are supposed to announce rain's coming. Exciting. Boy, last year we had, were in a drought. We needed rain. And, and that's what the clouds are supposed to say. Hey, rain's coming. But he says they weren't doing that. They were producing a tempest, and almost the idea of destruction, a whirlwind. A tornado, the wind was damaging. Instead of bringing life, it was bringing destruction. See, Clouds carried with a tempest. Lots of noise, lots of motion, but nothing profitable happening. They're false teachers. They're empty, destructive winds. Then he says, the mist of darkness, verse 17. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. These verses so, sound so much like Jude. Let me read you Jude 12 and 13. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. See, these apostates promise to lead people to the light, but they themselves, the Bible says, end up in the darkest darkness. I honestly believe what the Bible talks about, too much is given, much is required, and there's, I believe there are hottest 
or in this case, darkest or greater degrees of punishment in hell. And these apostates, God says, he's reserved. Think of that, this type of punishment. The blackness of darkness forever. The worst part of hell. Verse 18, since these false teachers really have nothing, they have nothing to offer. Look at verse 18. But when they speak great swelling words, you think, wow, this really sounds like something, he says, of vanity. <laughs> you know, vanity is emptiness. It's, it's, it's all these great words, but he's saying nothing. They allure through the lust of the flesh. Remember I warned of that freedom, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. And so they have nothing to give, but they're attracting all these false followers. So how do they do it? He gives three reasons here why they do it. Number one, false teachers are eloquent many times. Eloquent promoters of their doctrine, their teachings, their beliefs. That's what he's saying in verse 18. Here they are, speaking great swelling words. It sounds big, it sounds great. They're inflated words that say nothing. It's high-sounding nonsense, John Phillips said. But all they're doing is blowing verbal bubbles. <laughs> what they say is sound without substance. Their words are worthless because they're devoid of truth, end of quote. So, Paul wasn't like this. Paul could have talked like this. But Paul said, I never tried to do that. The gospel is enough. The power of God's word is enough. The power of the Holy Spirit of God is enough. He didn't have to try to make it sound like something great by his wisdom or his words. Let me read you what I mean. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. See, he knew the difference between communication and manipulation. Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Isn't that what it sounds like when he says these great swelling words, vanity, allure through the lust of the flesh? Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so here's someone that's speaking the truth versus someone that's speaking error. And then secondly, these reasons why they're able to fool these people is false teacher eloquent. False teachers, secondly, appeal to the base appetites of the old nature. The lust of the flesh. See, they avoid talking about sin. They avoid talking about repentance. They let you keep your pride. Uh, they, it's like these people are just coming away from this type of carnal lifestyle, worldly lifestyle. They maybe just got saved. That's the indication here in verse 18. Those that were clean escaped from, their, from them who live in air. They just made a decision or they're on the brink of making a decision. And they offer the drunk a drink, so to speak. Oh, you can still drink. It's okay. You know, just don't do too much. They offer fleshly people flesh. That's what he's saying. They're offering carnal people worldliness. <laughs> they, they just maybe got saved, or they're about to get saved. What do you think new Christians are? They're worldly. They're not spiritual. It takes a time to develop an appetite. It takes time to sow these things to begin to reap this type of a spiritual walk with God and an appetite. It doesn't happen immediate. They don't immediately know the Bible. They don't immediately have a hunger for it all. God begins to develop those desires, but that flesh is strong when they got saved. And the Spirit grow, grows strength as you feed the Spirit, as the Bible teaches. And so, this is what they offer. Wealth. God wants you to have things. He wants you to be blessed. God wants you to enjoy this. Wantonness. What does that word mean? We wouldn't use that word today. Through much wantonness, it means lewdness or sexual excesses. Lewdness. So this is the base things they're appealing to. And the third reason they are successful with false teachers appeal to the immature people. The end of verse 18. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in air. These that are just now, they're unstable souls. They've just maybe made a decision or on the brink of it. They've very recently maybe got saved. 
The apostate has no message for the down and out sinner, but he does have a message for the new believer. You ever notice someone that makes a decision for Christ? Now all of a sudden all these cousins show up and family members show up. Oh, you've got to come to our church. You've got to be involved. We're so happy for you. And you want to say, hey, where were they when you were lost? Where were they when you didn't have? And now you've gotten saved and, and God's doing something in your life. And they want, oh, you've got to come to our church. You've got to be in our. And, and, but uh, hey, we, 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 we reach you. We want to have you come. But this all, all time happens. I read of a missionary that was talking about this in their in the Philippines and what they, these false cults and things were doing over there. They were reaching people through ministry. Uh, the, the, this missionary was in the Philippines. They were conducting open-air meetings, and those that made a decision for Christ, they were bringing them in at the tent and giving them some follow-up material and, be, and begin a, a brief beginning discipleship. And uh, then as they finished with that, they would leave, and as they would walk out of the crowd, these false teachers were looking for the people that had the follow-up material in their hands. And they were attaching themselves to them and saying, oh, we're so glad you have interest in spiritual things and began to introduce their, their religion to these unstable souls, which is exactly what the Bible says they do. This is why it's important, certainly, for church discipleship, what we're trying to do here in mentoring discipleship and helping new converts. So the freedom the apostates offer is a false freedom. Because it's based on false promises. Number two, not only is it false freedom because it's based on false promises, but it's offered by false Christians. Look at verse 19, 20. While they promise, these false teachers promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord... And Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So you cannot set someone free if you're in bondage yourself. You can't take the chains of sin and you can't help someone know Christ and know true freedom if you're in bondage yourself. And these people, of course, aren't interested in offering them true freedom. Uh, they are leading them purposely down a wrong path, see. And Peter made it clear in verse 20 that these men had temporarily disentangled themselves from the pollution of the world. That's how they got in the church in the first place. And they looked pretty good. They had some experience, if you will. But then they went right back into bondage again. They professed to be saved, but had never been redeemed, never been truly set free. And temporary reformation without true repentance, true rebirth, if you will, only leads to greater sin and judgment. Let me give you something Jesus said, if you take the Lord's word for it. Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. Jesus said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I'll return to my house from whence I came out. When he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Meaning, I'm going to be moral. I'm going to have character. I'm going to get rid of these bad things, these pollutions of the world, all outward. But you have to put something in its place. You have to have Jesus. It's not enough to turn over a new leaf. You need Jesus. And he puts away all these things. In the end, the Bible says he's worse than he was to start with. That sounds a lot like what he's saying here, doesn't it? Read verse 20 and 21 with me what, after I read what Jesus just said in Matthew. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb that dogs return to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed her wall in the mire. So reformation cleans up the outside, but regeneration changes the inside. That's what they're lacking. A new nature. Uh, hey, we've been saved. You're no longer a dog. You're no longer a pig, as he refers to them as a sow and a dog. You're a son now. There's a new nature. That's what he's saying. Sin always promises freedom, but it delivers bondage. The devil always said, hey, you come over here. You do some of this. No, hey, you, you're free. You drink a little of this. You can do a little of this drugs. 
You're free to do that. Hey, it's okay. And then before long, you're in bondage by it. See? Oh, I'm just going to go over here and do something. I enjoy this. I like this. It's okay to watch this movie or do this. I, I'm, enjoy, I'm, I'm getting something from me. I like this. And before long, you're in bondage. See? Sin always promises freedom, but delivers bondage. It always promises life, but delivers death. You really be living now, but that's not what you get. Even the bondage that sin creates is deceitful. People who are bound actually think they're free many times. Oh, I'm still calling my own shots. Listen to Hebrews 3.13. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Too late they discover they're in bondage to their own appetites and habits. See, Jesus Christ came to free us from that. In the Bible, freedom doesn't mean doing your own thing. It doesn't mean having it your way. That attitude is the very essence of sin. Right from the beginning, Cain and Abel, I'm going to do it my way. That's the attitude of sin. The attitude of freedom is saying, I'm going to yield. I'm going to rest in trust in Him. I'm going to yield to Jesus. That's where life is easy. You start calling your own shots, I'm telling you, it gets hard pretty quick. You start making all your own choices. I can introduce you to people. Life gets complicated pretty quick. If it just goes with what feels right today and then what feels right tomorrow, you can have a lot of mess real fast. You can be entangled with that type of freedom really quickly. But you want freedom to have the life that you really want, that God promised? It comes in yieldedness to the Lord, resting and trusting. This is what God said is best for me. And I believe it. And I'm going to trust him. The Quaker leader Rufus Jones, paraphrasing Aristotle, said, the true nature of a thing is the highest it can become. A pig's a pig. <laughs> a dog's a dog. But a son is a son. See, Jesus Christ frees us from the bondage of sin, gives us a new nature. His nature, 2 Peter 1, 4 said, the divine nature. See, as we face, face the truth honestly, then we can look at ourselves honestly. You say, what do you mean? Our world tells us today, men are basically good. Man, man is basically good. People are good people. They have good hearts. It's just their environment that's caused the way they are. It's just, you know, they've been mistreated. That's their problem. But the Bible helps us to understand what we really are. Truth helps us to understand honestly what we really are. The Bible says there's none good. God says, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, it helps us to be honest. We've all turned aside. We've all gone our own way. We've all, like sheep, have gone astray. The truth helps us be honest and understand this is reality. I'm not basically good. If it wasn't for the Lord, no one would want to be around me. And the same goes for you. We're all wicked sinners, every one of us. We're able to see our need for the truth, see we're able to look at reality instead of living in fantasy. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Through the word of God, we discover the truth about ourselves, about our world, and about our God. But you can expect nothing but false freedom from false Christians who offer false promises. And then there's a third reason. Lastly, why the freedom is false, it involves a false experience. Verse 21, 22 says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. And after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed her mouth wallowing in the mire. Judas looked good for several years, but in the end he kissed the door of heaven and walked away. Capernaum had the privilege of having Jesus there and doing all these wonderful works as Capernaum was like the base for Jesus. And Jesus would say, Woe unto you, Capernaum! If Sodom and Gomorrah would have had the light that you've had, if these wonderful works had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they had repented long ago. See, they had all that light, all that opportunity, but they didn't trust the Lord. It had been better for them not to have known Jesus and known all his marvelous works than to have known it and not received him. He said, it's going to be worse for you in the day of judgment than it will be for them. 
I remember hearing a preacher at the end that say, friend, if you walk away today from the Lord Jesus and don't trust Christ, in the day of judgment, I'll be your worst enemy. Because it's been better you had never heard the gospel than to hear it, which you have today, and walk out the doors, and now one day you'll stand before Christ, and the Lord will say, that person shared the gospel with you. And you turned to my from my grace. You heard the right way. You had been introduced, verse 21, if you will, to the way of righteousness. Verse 20, you had, you had knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they never received that. Verse 15, they forsook the right way. They saw it. They could have turned on that, but they went the way of Balaam. See, these are not people losing their salvation. That's an impossibility. These are people that had some type of a profession, but never a possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter called these apostates natural brute beasts. And he ends the warning here from verse 12 to 22 by calling them pigs and dogs. These are not sheep. These are not God's children. We must understand all the way through this passage the pronoun they. Some people want to give you the idea that they lost their salvation here. They fell from grace, and people that teach you lose your salvation. That's not the case here. If you follow the pronoun they all the way through, it's talking about the false teachers. And through the whole paragraph, notice verse 17, it begins that. In verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words. Follow verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are serving corruption. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world. Pollution deals with outward. Corruption inward. The Bible says that they are in bondage, their own corruption. They are again entangled and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it, it, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, turned from the, whole, the holy commandment delivered unto them. These are not people that lost their salvation at all. These are people the whole time that heard the truth but never received it. They professed some experience, else they would not have gotten the church. Like I said earlier in, in Peter's day, they wouldn't have gotten into the true church as he's warning. They were put the sheep's clothing on for a while, but it wasn't long their true nature was revealed. As a dog and a pig, a brute beast, a wolf in sheep's clothing. These false teachers are not truly born again. Though, as we've seen, we'll try to deceive newborn, again, believers. See, it's not a profession of spirituality that marks a true believer. It's possession of the Spirit of God within. That's salvation. It's not simply praying a prayer. Now, that's what I've said in the past. It's not enough just someone to say, oh, yeah, I prayed a prayer. Yeah, I've been saved. Show me. Now, I'm not saying they have to prove it to me. But James said that faith that works is dead. And he said, if you really are saved, let's see it. Your life ought to witness of that salvation. You say, well, I just got saved. Well, then in time, it ought to show that you've been saved. Your life has changed. You're a new creature. New nature's been given to you. You're no longer a pig and a dog, as he uses the illustration. Now, I'm not pick, picking pig and dog. That's what God said. Natural brute beast. But now you're a son. Now you have a divine nature within. No longer this sinful old nature, this old man, but a new man. These apostates had a religious experience. That's how they got in the church. But it was false. And their experience, like their promises, were false. See, Peter emphasized new birth all the way through. If you go to 1 Peter with me, chapter 1, verse 3, he emphasizes the new birth. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy have begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Chapter 1, Still in 1 Peter, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So he emphasizes this salvation in chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he spoke of partakers of the divine nature. He talks to them about being sheep in 1 Peter again, chapter 2, verse 25. For we were as sheep going astray, but now are returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Uh, chapter 5 of 1 Peter, verses 1 through 4, he exhorts them to feed the flock of God. 
And it starts again about talking about them being sheep. But here he doesn't talk about these people ever being sheep. They're brute beasts, they're pigs, they're dogs, they're, they're, they're not gods. They never were his. They made some false, they're deceivers all the way through. It's lies, it's lust, like I said before, all the way through. And that's what they're about. There's no indication the false teacher ever experienced new birth. They talked the talk, but they never became a sheep. And by the way, I know today dogs are pampered pets, but in the Bible days, they were outcasts. They hated dogs. They were on the, on the trash heaps. That's where the dogs were. Uh, they were licking the sores of the, of the you know, uh, the Bible talks about. They were despised animals. They're filthy scavengers. That's the way they looked at them. And, of course, you know how Jews felt about pigs, right? And so this is the awfulest of the awful he's using here. They pointed to an experience, but they were, it was all counterfeit. That's the way these were. It was a false experience. You can wash up the pig, take him to the show, put the bow on him, put the shoe polish on his hoofs, make it look real nice, but still a pig. <laughs> when he gets home, it can't wait to get back in the mud. Same with a dog. Pig was cleaned up on the outside. The dog vomited. He got cleaned up on the inside. He fell a little better, but still a dog. Still a dog. It wasn't long before the corrupt appetite was back and he was eating his own vomit. Quite a picture. No new nature. Pig looked better, the dog felt better, but neither had been changed. Same old nature. See, they escaped the pollutions, but not the corruption, as I mentioned. True believers have received a new nature, a divine nature, and they have new and different appetites and desires. I think about when I got saved, how my life was changed. I wasn't off in sin somewhere. I wasn't in, a, in, in some alley somewhere. I was an eight-year-old boy. But what I noticed the biggest change when I received the Lord as my Savior and I recognized that I was a sinner, deserving of hell, and I had chosen sin many times. I had gone my own way. I was not good. There is none good. There is none righteous. No, not one. And I recognized I was a sinner, deserving of hell. But Jesus had paid that penalty. When I got saved and I asked the Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I repented my sin and asked him to get into my heart to save me, as he wants to do for you tonight if you don't know him as Savior. When I got saved, what I noticed was my desire changed. I didn't desire the slop. I didn't desire the vomit anymore as these animals here he mentions. What I desired was the Lord. I had a desire for his word. I already had gone to church and things like that, but now I wanted to learn something the church. I wanted to get something. I want to know more about this Savior that loved me like this. See, the desire has changed. God wants to transform us to sheep, a new nature in, within us. J. Vernon McGee gives the story of the prodigal son and the prodigal pig. The son was with the pigs, but he was still the son while he was with the pigs. One day he got up and said, I'm going back home to my father's house. He was always a son the whole time he was gone. See, the pig could have been at the father's house, but no longer, no matter how long he was at the father's house, it was still a pig. See, and one day the, new, the nature would show up. So entangled with freedom. And people that go off after these apostates, they're in bondage. It's a false freedom. The true nature of a thing is the highest that it can become. And Peter condemned this with the most for forceful language or some of the most forceful language you're going to find in the New Testament about these apostates, these false teachers. And the big difference between what Peter was and he saw himself as a backslidden Christian when he fell, there's a big difference between him and an apostate Judas, see. He was a sinner, he was a, a, a sinner, a saved man that was in sin, backslidden. But here's one that was never a son, never saved. And Judas, the apostate. So it's based on false promises. This is a false freedom. It's entangled with freedom. It's a false freedom because it's based on false promises. It's offered by false Christians and those that were involved in a false experience. From start to finish, that freedom is a product of the devil's offering. It's a deception. and That's what he's trying to paint the picture all the way through chapter 2. We'll be in chapter 3 when we meet next week. I want, you to tell, to want to tell you what he says in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, you can now appreciate as you read through chapter 2. He says, make your calling and election sure. See, there are lots of people that professed. Jesus said, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord. And he'll say to them, I never knew you. 
depart from me. He didn't say some. He said many in that day. So Peter is trying to strengthen the brethren. He says, make your call and election sure. Make sure you're saved. Make sure you've not just made some profession, but you've possessed the Lord Jesus. He's come in. He's changed you. You know you have that new nature as witnessed by the Holy Spirit of God. I'll tell you, it's a startling fact the number of people in churches that are lost, grew up in church, have been in church, still in church, some still thinking they're going to go to heaven because of the person they are, but they don't truly know Christ as Savior. They've had an experience maybe, but they've never been part of the divine nature. I think so often of the story of Ruth. Here Naomi goes with her husband, two boys. Here they go into Moab. Ruth and Orpah, so similar. Both Moabites, both married a Hebrew. Both lost their husband. Both had been raised pagan for worshiping false gods. Both had heard the great truth of redemption. Both had learned of the true and living God from their relationship in Ruth's family. Or Naomi's family, excuse me. We know that, Ruth 1, 16 and 17, when Ruth says, when she tries to tell her, go back home, Ruth, go back. She says, no, your God will be my God. Your people, my people. Uh, both had been introduced to this. Both were faced with a crisis, a decision, a choice. Both professed, we're going to stay with you, Naomi. We're going back with you. But Orpah, after a few steps, turned back. And as far as the pages of Scripture go, she's gone forever. But Ruth stays with Naomi. Ruth wasn't a, just a professor. She possessed the real thing. And Ruth will see in heaven. She ends up in the line of Christ. See, that's the difference between Two people maybe had a similar experience, but if they, one meant business with God, one received the Lord as their Savior, one prayed a prayer, but still had the old nature and never, never had a new nature, never knew the Lord, desired and before long went back to the old way, the pig back to the mire, the dog back to his own vomit. Perhaps Peter here recalled Judas as he writes this. Everything looks so good. You don't give the guy the bag, the money bag, if you don't trust him. Everybody trusted Judas. He held the bag. Everything looks so good. But he knew it was a lie the whole time. That's bound.